Thanks so much for coming. This is a joint project produced by an international team involving Camilla Grachova here, Sasha Yarkin also here, Kuhn Schurz, which was here just recently, so he must be fresh in your memory, and myself. What we wanted to do was, ouch, sorry, not my day. What we wanted to do was to find out to what extent national institutions affect visa regimes uh, for citizens of a given country. That is to say, if you live in country X, uh, this country can characterize by certain institutional quality. If your domestic institutions are better than others, will it make it easier for you to travel abroad? Will it reduce visa requirements for you if you want to go to another country? Will it sometimes eliminate visas if you want to go to another country? There is a general belief in the strength of national institutions and basically it states that when your institutions improve, your life is getting better. Uh, is it also true when you talk about visa regimes? Well, when we tried to answer this question, we discovered <coughs> that there is a sizable, not huge, but sizable and quite interesting literature on the topic. Uh, there are a lot of studies which uh, explore uh, the links between institutions and migration but usually we talk about long-term migration. And it's shown that strong institutions, all else equal, attract people from other countries, even if you control for other factors which are uh, essential for migrational choices. In our case, we're not talking about uh, long-term migration, about emigration, immigration. We're talking about short-term travel. And uh, short-term travel oftentimes involves meeting visa requirements of the countries that you want to visit. Uh, uh, for Russia, the number of countries where you go uh, with no visas, visa-free access is growing and includes quite a number of fairly decent countries, but uh, quite obviously these countries welcome Russian nationals as potential tourist visitors, so on and so forth. But still, uh, if you want to go to a uh, well-developed, uh, economically successful market democracy such as Schengen, the US, North America, Australia, so on and so forth, uh, you are required to get a visa. And sometimes, unfortunately, your visa applications are denied. Uh, now, probably the first thing to mention is that <coughs> uh, this is a world of an increased global mobility. And this is trifle, you know, this is a trivial observation. But uh, travel is an exception from this universal mobility trends. Uh, there are few and few restrictions for mobility of goods, services, capital, information, so on and so forth. But as far as human travel is concerned, uh, the picture is mixed. On the one hand, you see some countries uh, reducing visa barriers, but some countries vis-a-vis -vis other countries increase these visa barriers, and that creates what is called a global mobility divide. By the way, this is a very different Mao that you see here. So there is probably more than one Mao who is an economist, and this one deals with uh, visa regimes. Uh, and as I just said before, uh, there is a big literature which uh, studies the impact of institutions on visa regimes, uh, on, on, on international migration, but much less so on visa regimes. Uh, visa rules are outcomes of complex policy consideration. There are costs and benefits of visas. And we're talking about the receiving country. On the one hand, every country wants to open itself up for tourists, for business people, for visitors and uh, there is a group for skilled individuals and there is a good number of interest groups which welcome unimpeded migration to a given country. And from that point of view, visas are nuisances and you want to see them eliminated or made, you know, formalities rather than serious obstacles. But on the other hand, there are serious concerns about people coming to your country and those involve security, terrorism, crime human trafficking, a major concern is the fear that someone said that she wants to become a tourist, but in fact she will stay here, she will overstay her visa term, and God knows what she will be doing here. So from that point of view, you want to increase to, to elevate your visa barriers. And uh, the visa rules that you see in the world reflect this cost-benefit calculations, and they're very different for different countries. And one thing to keep in mind is that visa regimes are bilateral, they are dyadic, they involve two countries. One is a so-called sending country, another one is a receiving country. Another thing that I would like to mention, 
as a general uh, observation is that uh, national visa regimes are driven and reflect informational symmetry. If it were clear and obvious what are the true intentions of a given individual, and if it was clear and obvious what personal traits this individual has or does not have, then visas would not be national, visas would be individual. Uh, for every individual, no matter what country uh, he is a national of, uh, there would be certain uh, uh, procedures to go and uh, to get an access, hopefully. Now, you cannot have access to this information. Furthermore, you cannot discriminate on uh, grounds other than nationality. You cannot discriminate on grounds of gender, ethnicity, so on and so forth. So a nationality is the only legitimate and institutionalized means to regulate entry into your country. And as such, visa regimes reflect expectations. If you have informational symmetry, the best thing you can rely on in general before you deal with a particular individual is what you expect from this individual. What country does he belong to? And visa regimes therefore reflect priors about a given country. If these priors are favorable, in other words, if you believe that most people who live in this country are law-abiding uh, individuals who will do what they say they will, then uh, of course you will make a few errors of certain kind, but they would be negligible. And the benefits of an unimpeded access of these country citizens to your country would overweigh the cost. And in that case, visa re requirements for, that, for such country would be nominal, uh, very easy to comply with, or sometimes they will simply be eliminated. This is what, known as, uh, this is what is known as visa waivers. Uh, on the other hand, if priors are negative, and that is if you are skeptical about uh, a particular country, its population, its nationals, in that case you would rather have visas and these visa requirements will be obligatory for every person in that country because you don't have any other information until and unless a consular officer processes this person's visa application. So informational symmetry is in the heart of uh, bilateral uh, visa regimes. Now, uh, very briefly, what we know about visa regimes in the world, and this is a very nice table which is drawn from a very recent uh, paper by the very same Mao. Uh, over the last 20 plus years, there was an increase of visa waiver situations where country A allows nationals of country B without a visa. So for every country in the world, you can calculate, count the number of countries that would accept these country citizens without a visa, that would establish a visa-free, visa waiver visa regime for this particular country. And you calculate averages uh, for different countries, and basically, by and large, there is a deep divide. People who live in economically su successful market democracies enjoy a uh, high freedom of mobility around the world. Such people would normally be welcome. Uh, pretty much everywhere in the world with very light, if at all, visa requirements. People who live in the rest of the world, who live in countries uh, with uh, poor democratic quality and uh, countries which are less economically successful, by and large, will be uh, required to have visas. So here are uh, data for two years. One is 1969, another one is 2010. And you see that uh, uh, almost 50 years ago, OECD countries <coughs> Uh, on the average had uh, visa-free access to 46 countries in the world. But please note that there was a substantial fluctuation within this group of countries. Standard deviation is almost 20. For non-OECD, uh, the number is 18. Is it like share of number of countries or the share of citizens? No, it's number of countries. This is the average number of countries to which a citizen of a given OECD country can go without a visa. And this, is, this average is across OECD countries, and another one is across non-OECD. Just a clarification, yeah. is there any significant difference in sizes for countries for those two groups? We'll talk about detailed factors that affect these regimes very shortly. This is a very brief snapshot to give an idea how it looks like, you know, from, from birds' eye view. Uh, so on the average, as I said, uh, uh, in 1969, uh, uh, a citizen of OECD country could go to about 50 countries of the world without a visa. Whereas uh, for a citizen of a non-OECD country, the rest of the world, the number is 18, much less. And now fast forward 40 years and we see that there is a very slight increase for non-OECD, uh, statistically insignificant probably, from 18 to 22. And there was a considerable increase uh, 
uh, for OECD countries from 46 to 73. So there is a big mobility divide in the modern world. And another thing I want to draw attention to is that within non-OECD countries, there is still a wide fluctuation of visa-free accessibility. So the standard deviation is actually almost equal to the average. In other words, there are non-OECD countries which enjoy quite a bit of uh, visa-free access to the rest of the world, and there are always non-OECD countries which do not have such access. Now, there is, as I mentioned before, a considerable literature which explains variations of uh, visa barriers uh, around the world. And here are some of the factors that the previous literature highlights. Uh, it's certainly the wealth of the country, GDP per capita. It's the distance between countries. And in fact, uh, the distance between countries enters negatively in, uh, uh, well, uh, if two countries are closer to each other, then all else equal, visa barriers between these two countries will be higher because distance gives you a natural protection against unwanted visitors. So if you are close neighbors, then all else equal, they will have higher visa barriers than it would be otherwise. Uh, so distance between countries, lower barriers, GDP per capita, lower barriers, tourism business ties, quite obviously it's lower barriers because all these are arguments in favor of reducing visa barriers, as we mentioned before. <coughs> Risks of political instability in the sending country, certainly higher uh, barriers. Risk of terrorism and conflicts in the sending country, ditto. Uh, surprisingly, uh, there are no institutions in this list, uh, and uh, uh, it's indeed, uh, you know, the absence of institutions is, uh, is surprising, uh, and we are probably the first who are trying to fill this gap and to see, it's conspicuous and it's surprising to fill this gap and trying to see if uh, institutions matter. I mentioned before that visa policies are outcomes of complex, cost-benefit considerations and preferences of various interest groups, and they balance uh, <coughs> perceived gains with costs and risks that, involve, that are involved in different visa regimes. And we are interested, we are curious as to how sending countries, formal and informal institutions, affect outcomes of such balancing acts. I said at the very beginning of our presentation that on the average you expect that when institutions improve, so does the life of people who live under these institutions. It, they make better institutions make your life better. And is it true that formal institutions, if they improved and we have ways to measure formal institutions, reduce visa barriers? Is it true that informal institutions, also known as social capital, very loosely defined, do the same thing? Uh, let me give you a couple of uh, preliminary arguments which actually uh, suggest or <coughs> explain what will follow about uh, whether it's true that better institutions uh, would lower visa barriers. Uh, one reason to leave your country of origin and citizenship and to move somewhere else, and often time to do so illegally by pretending to be a short-term visitor and in fact intending to overstay and otherwise violate your visa restrictions, is that you're not satisfied with the life of your country. And this dissatisfaction that the refugee crisis <coughs> and migrant crisis in Europe clearly demonstrates are, is often rooted in abysmal economic conditions in your country. Now, good institutions are known to improve economic conditions in your country, and therefore they reduce the appeal of traveling abroad. And if so, if someone lives in a country with good institutions, you could expect that this person will be by and large satisfied with economic conditions and opportunities at home and therefore uh, his uh, uh, incentive or her incentive to move somewhere else would be quite a bit weaker and this is a good news for the receiving country. That person would be a bona fide visitor uh, who will bring his money, his knowledge, his whatnot, but would not be abusing the rules of the receiving country. Another thing about good institutions which make us to believe that better institutions reduce visa barriers is that <coughs> oftentimes good institutions are affiliated with certain cultural traits such as compliance with rules. And if you comply with the rules in your home country, if you pay taxes in time, if you observe laws, regulations, so on and so forth, chances are you'll do the same with the visa requirements and immigration rules of the receiving country. And that again makes you more welcome in that country that would be otherwise. But think about something else. Uh, sometimes you can expect that surprisingly and counterintuitively, uh, good institutions will lead, will result in higher visa barriers. How come? Uh, good institutions, among other things, are rules. 
And the purpose of this rule is to restrict undesirable behavior at home, to restrict economically unproductive behavior, such as crime, violence, rent seeking, and so on and so forth. Suppose that there is a certain percentage of one of country A's population, which is for whatever reasons inclined to be engaged in such behavior. And certainly uh, these people will first be exploring opportunities at hand back home. But if there are fewer opportunities of this kind back home, in other words, if there is an improvement in the rule of law in the protection of property rights, if police is doing a better job, if courts are more effective, independent, so on and so forth. So to the extent that these people still want to do something illegal, they will be seeking for opportunities to do this abroad. In other words, there will be an export, a spillover of bad guys from your country if you tighten uh, institutions' rules in your home country. And if that is the case, then uh, improvement, at least in some of your national institutions, will result in higher visa barriers. So this is also something that we can anticipate. Now, how about uh, informal institutions? Uh, when we talk about informal institutions, something that we study more or less full time, we're talking about various ingredients of social capital, uh, such as norms, morale, values, trust, trustworthiness, and so forth. Uh, why would informal institutions matter? One possibility is that uh, potential travelers, visitors, will bring their own traits from home. And if these are good traits, if they're law-abiding people with high moral values and so on and so forth, again, they would be welcome. If otherwise, that will probably make receiving countries more cautious and concerned about allowing these people, which will result in higher visa barriers. Also, we, it is known that social capital is correlated uh, oftentimes very strongly with respect and trust in official rules and requirements. And again, we're talking about official rules and requirements in the home country, but if people have such habits domestically, then chances are they will be obey and observe the rules in the receiving country. Uh, there is a, uh, an interesting literature which suggests that formal and informal institutions oftentimes complement each other. In other words, payoff to formal institutions depends on the conditions of informal institutions. And vice versa, Guida Tabellini was among the first to highlight this uh, complementarity, but we also did some work of this kind, which uh, suggests, Bowles and Ginter's uh, same thing, which suggests that civic culture, which is a part of social capital, affects uh, uh, economic payoff to, uh, to, to, to public service provision, and therefore there is uh, a complementarity between uh, social capital and political institutions, democratic institutions, for example. Now, uh, we can expect also to observe a similar complementarity in the case of visas, very simply, because uh, to the extent that the improvement in the rule of law would expel, push out bad guys, from country A to other countries, uh, the strength of this effect will depend on how many bad guys are in your home country. That is social capital. If there is a high level of uh, uh, trust, uh, uh, not necessarily trust, I was perhaps too, uh, uh, too quick to mention trust, uh, but norm, morale, uh, compliance with law, so on and so forth, if these are traits which are common in country A, in that case, uh, the improvement of the rule of law in that country will probably not have such a clearly pronounced spillover effect, simply because there were no one to spill over. And in that case, we will not observe a negative adverse impact of the strengthening of the rule of law in that country to institutional barriers. So this is our intuition. Uh, okay, now I want to go forward, not backward. Uh, to summarize, to conclude would be to uh, borrow, I should say, this expression of unbundling institutions from Asimoglu and Robinson, who published a paper with the same title about 10 years ago. And in that paper, they stressed that you have to distinguish between different types of institutions that would be inappropriate to bundle various institutions, government effectiveness, rule of law, contracts, property rights, so on, in one heap, because they play different roles. And we actually do the same. Uh, what we suggest what that is that we, we should expect that institution services which are supply public goods, production inputs, and so on and so forth, the quality of institution services should be negatively correlated with the restrictions for the reason which I just explained. If you improve institution services, you make life in your home country better, you make uh, uh, national economy more productive, you make the appeal of staying at home more uh, strong than in comparison with moving abroad. However, if you talk about institutions rules, 
uh, the outcome could be different for the reason that I, that I explained. I explained, and therefore, we could observe a positive correlation between uh, the conditions of institutions' roles and visa barriers. And uh, there, is, there, is a, there is a very influential paper by Baron and Keeney about mediating and moderating effects. Uh, they are psychologists, but it's a very popularly used paper in social sciences, including economics, where they explain what the difference is. And if you haven't seen this paper, I strongly recommend to do so. It could be quite useful. Uh, how to, uh, how, if there are two variables, and there is a third variable which affects the relations between the two, then the third could be could play a role of either uh, mediator or moderator. If it's a mediator, then the third variable describes a mechanism through which the first affects the second. And if it's a mediator, uh, and if it's a moderator, then the third variable would affect the strength of such mechanisms. So in our case, we expect that informal institutions are a moderating variable, which affects the, the link between uh, uh, institutions' rules and visa barriers. Let me very briefly introduce to you a formal model, which uh, basically attempts to you know, make the uh, intuition expressed a few minutes ago more precise, and which generates testable hypotheses. And after that, I will spend the rest of my presentation's time to present the empirical results. Uh, in this model, uh, we expect that institution services improve productivity. Uh, every agent can be engaged in either productive behavior or loosely defined rent seeking. And rent seeking could take place <coughs> either, <coughs> excuse me, at home or abroad. If an agent is involved in productive behavior, uh, she produces A units of output. And A is a measure of institutions services. As far as institutions' rules are concerned, among other things, they restrict uh, expropriation of the output produced by people involved in productive behavior. So uh, the share of the output that a producer keeps is a measure of institutions' rules. As far as informal institutions are concerned, there are various ways to measure them, and that affects the complexity of the model. We want to keep it simple, and we made a very crude assumption that there is a certain percentage of agents in, in the unit continuum in this economy, which are initially predisposed to be engaged in, uh, in rent seeking, just because of their individual traits. And the question is, uh, and, 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 and uh, the question is where they will be engaged in rent seeking, at home uh, or abroad. And P, the percentage of these people, is our measure of uh, social capital. Now, as I said, there are different activities in this economy. Activity number one is a productive behavior, and we know what happens if you are involved in productive behavior. Have a look at the payoff at the bottom of this slide. A person who is engaged in productive behavior produces A units of output and keeps the portion sigma of that production. So the overall uh, payoff is A sigma. Otherwise, people could be engaged in uh, domestic rent seeking or foreign rent seeking. And to be engaged in foreign rent seeking, you want to travel abroad. You pretend to be a visitor, a short term visitor. You will get a visa, you find yourself abroad, and you'll start doing uh, funny things in a different country. Uh, what uh, drives the uh, choice between rent seeking at home and rent seeking at abroad is the cost of relocation. Different people are, uh, uh, people are different in how easy is it for them to move to another country. So they have different relocation costs. And that might have to do with personal experience, education, age, knowledge of language, uh, uh, geographic uh, proximity, so on and so forth. And we, exp we assume that this relocation cost is distributed according to a certain cumulative distribution function. So uh, now variables of interest are percentages of individuals in a given economy that would be engaged in uh, uh, productive behavior at uh, home uh, uh, in, uh, and in rent seeking at home in abroad. And there should be a balance. Uh, P plus R1 plus R2. Okay. Uh, now, uh, in equilibrium, uh, I want to find, uh, I want to follow the ratio of those who are engaged in productive behavior uh, to those uh, who are involved in, who are engaged in domestic rent seeking. And n is the ratio, and then uh, the, the equation that you see here describe an equilibrium. And it's very easy to show that the equilibrium is, it always exists 
and is unique. Our uh, variables of interest are R1 and R2. R1 are domestic rent seekers. R2 are people who want to travel abroad and to engage in rent seeking abroad. And the total is 1 minus P. I, I made a mistake. P is the percentage of law abiding people. Well, and this is a measure of social capital. 1 minus P is the balance. And these are the people that want to do bad things, either at home or abroad. Uh, so the comparative statics uh, analysis of uh, this uh, model suggests that uh, the equilibrium value of uh, R2, and this is the number of rent seekers who want to travel abroad, increases uh, in the quality of protection of property rights, which reproduces the spillover effect that I uh, explained verbally at the beginning of my presentation. In other words, if you strengthen the property rights protection at home, that makes it more difficult to seek uh, rent seeking gains at home. And uh, since people want to be involved in rent seeking, going abroad becomes of uh, greater appeal for them. And at the same time, uh, it decreases in the quality of uh, institution services that is in a why is it so? Because if A increases, then the domestic economy becomes more productive and it offers better opportunities for rent seeking, all else uh, equal. Uh, and therefore, we can conclude that strengthening of the domestic rule of law increases the number of visa applicants who intend to violate the law of the receiving country. And we should also expect that this effect is more pronounced for lower stocks, domestic social capital, in other words, for lower values of P. And at the same time, improvement of domestic institution services decreases the number of uh, ill-intended applicants. Now, I didn't tell you, well, let me, let me spend just a couple of things. I think that's a more interesting part of this model. So far, we talk about intentions of people to go abroad with, uh, with the intent to violate visa rules. We didn't talk much about visa issues per se. Uh, now, uh, let's try to understand the motivations and the rationales of a consular officer who uh, processes a visa application from a certain individual. This consular, know, consular officer knows that some of the individuals who seek visas and pretend to be visitors, tourists, or business visitors or whatnot, in fact, want to uh, violate visa rules. And this consular officer, <coughs> remember I told at the very beginning that visa policies are driven by informational symmetry and they're based on priors. But the, uh, it's not just visa requirements that are based on priors, that is the requirement to obtain a visa, but it's also a matter of processing visa applications. Uh, all else equal, uh, the same visa applicants could have different decisions in different countries depending on the priors. And this is a very, known, very well known effect or result of uh, economics of asymmetric information. Because a consular officer that processes an application uh, would be looking for red lights, red flags, for some signs to make her alert about possible violator. But the way that she will be given, she will be giving to these signs will depend on her priors. If she knows that there is a significant probability on the average, a priori, that an applicant for a given country uh, intends to violate visa rules, then the very same signal will receive a different treatment. There is a certain al alarm threshold, and this alarm threshold is calculated using the bias rule. And what enters in these calculations using the bias rule is, of course, the priors. And therefore, unfavorable priors makes it less likely that the person will get a visa simply because when priors are bad, the same signal that would be ignored, dismissed, if a person comes from a population from a sample with positive priors, will get a very different treatment. And therefore, we conclude that our analysis leads to the following conclusions. The visa rejection, the visa rejection rate also increases in uh, the quality of uh, institutions rules and decreases in the quality of institution services. So here are the hypotheses that we bring to data. And we have a lot of data here. Uh, this is something that we did not know at the beginning of this study, but uh, now I think we have a good idea as to what is available. And I'll talk about that data, <coughs> not sources, in just a second. But in the meantime, the hypothesis. Uh, the first one is that visa bearers that, for the time being, we measure by the refusal rate, rise in the quality of domestic institutions' rules and decline in the quality of domestic institution services. And we also expect that visa bearers will decline in the stock of domestic social capital, such as norms and values. And norms and values complement institutions' rules 
as factors affecting visa regimes. Now here are the data on visa barriers. And we know of at least four distinct sources of such data. The first one is what is known as European Visa Database, uh, which uh, contains information on annual visa refusal rates by uh, Schengen countries, so for other countries in the world, almost all, there are some gaps in this. Uh, so you take a non-Schengen country, and you take a Schengen country, and for the period of time from 2006 to 2011, we know what was the percentage of refusal of visa applicants from the non-Schengen country by a given Schengen country. Similar data exists for the US and the UK. Now, another source of data is Hanley and Partners Passport Power Visa Restriction Index. What is, uh, what is power of your passport? Very simply, it's the number of countries that you can visit without a visa if you have that passport. And this passport power varies in a very wide range from 10, 15 to 100, 40, something like that. The most powerful passport, what is the most powerful passport in the world? I think it's Swedish or something like that. And, uh, and of course, the rest of Schengen is close by. Canadian is a pretty good passport and some others. Well, so this is what passport power. The third database is proudly our own. Camila Gracheva put together this bilateral visa regime database. In other words, for every two countries in the world, this database tells you what are the visa rules between these two countries. And we talk about different types of visas, tourist visa, business visa, so it's a pretty detailed database. And also, sometimes visa requirements differ from each other. And for example, until recently, if Russian nationals wanted to travel to Turkey, they were required a visa, but there was a formality. The visas were issued upon arrival. So there was a distinction between whether you have to apply for a visa in a home country, uh, go to a consulate, travel to, to a city where this consulate exists, or you just a simple formality. Now, just recently, we realized that there is another interesting source of uh, visa data, and this is IATA, which is International Air Transportation Association, uh, 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 Travel Information Manual. Uh, and uh, I think, in theory at least, every person who checks you in for a flight has access to this uh, manual. Uh, basically, uh, if you are a national of Russia and if you want to travel to a certain country, uh, the uh, the airline representative that helps you, uh, checks you uh, in for, for the flight, will see what are the visa rules with this country. And if there is a visa requirement, she'll start flipping through a passport, where is your visa, please? If there are none, she will simply beg you through. Okay, so there are different sources of data. And, and here are some of the uh, diagrams. You see what Schengen refusal rates are for non-Schengen countries. And these are averages uh, across Schengen. And the red arrow certainly, of course, indicates Russia. So the refusal rate for Russian nationals who travel to Schengen countries are pretty low, which is, which is, which is a good sign. They are quite a bit higher for the U.S. But again, you see huge variation in these refusal rates. And it's a natural question is what drives these differences. Our data on institutions are much more standard. Uh, formal institutions, uh, uh, this uh, governance, governance matters project, and they're all well known. Uh, and we use uh, rule of law and corruption prevention as proxies for institutions' rules, which suppress rent seeking behavior. And we expect that those should be positively correlated with visa barriers. And government effectiveness is, of course, uh, uh, institution service. Property rights uh, protection from Fraser Institute is another example. Oh, what's that? No, I don't want to allow that. Uh, okay, property rights is another example of an institution rule, very clearly. And again, it should be positively correlated with the barriers. Uh, as far as informal institutions are concerned, we use all five waves of the World Value Survey, and that's a natural source of data. Uh, we use data on trust, and also we use data on uh, morale and uh, compliance with law. And I'll explain what these data are. We take several, uh, uh, several variables uh, from World Value Survey. We do a principal component analysis, and we get aggregate variables which describe the level of morality of people in a given country, and also the level of, of the extent to which these people are complying with the law. For example, in the second category, we use answers to the question, uh, is it important to teach your children to obey the law? And so that would be a measure of compliance with the law. Now, standard controls, and the controls, as it is always the case in this kind of analysis, are suggested by previous research. GDP per capita, distance from Schengen, tourism, business ties, political stability, 
and absence of violence, terrorism, uh, World Bank uh, collects uh, such information. It's publicly available. Now, what are our identification strategies? There are several, and since I'm running out of time, I'll describe them very briefly and show the results. Uh, identification strategy one makes use of the visa refusal rates data that I mentioned before and regress these visa refusal rates uh, on uh, controls and institutional quality of the sending country. Please be aware that this is a dyadic regression in that our observation are, is comprised of two countries, the sending, ascending country and the receiving country, right? And also please observe <coughs> that since we are concerned or interested in the quality of institution in the sending country, this is essentially a panel data set and it's a three-dimensional panel it's the sending country, it's the receiving country, and it's the period of time. And there are different ways to construct a conventional two-dimensional model. In one case, the second variable, quote-unquote time variable, will be time. And in that case, you will average uh, refusal rates across Schengen. And in the second case, you would average refusal rates for a given Schengen country across time. And our baseline regressions follow that second strategy. The first one produces similar results but they're somewhat less pronounced. The second empirical strategy is, um, uh, makes use of regressions of sending countries' passport powers on domestic institution. That's the second data set. That's basically an attempt to explain. Uh, oh, no, I don't have variations of passport power. Do I have it somewhere? Excuse me. Oh, here we go. This is the variation of uh, uh, visa restriction or passport power index, which shows you how many countries a holder of a given country's passport can visit without visas. And again, red arrow indicates Russia. You see a considerable variation flow, as I said, from 20 plus to almost 180. So that's the second identification strategy. The third one is the most intriguing one, and that is uh, we will use visa regimes between countries, as uh, described by Camila Grachova's database, as a network. And we will apply network analysis and we'll single out clusters of countries which are hierarchically organized from more accessible to less accessible. When I say we, I'm not very precise or because that's a part of our project which is done by Kuhn Schurz and, and his Belgian colleague who has too long a name to be pronounced, but I'll make it when we make it there. Uh, all right, so here are three uh, 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 empirical strategies and the good news is that they're fairly consistent and all of them confirming, by and large, our hypotheses and intuitions. And in particular, all of them agree that improvements in institutions' rules, all else equal, make visa barriers higher. Improvements in institution services make visa barriers lower. As far as the role of social capital, our theory suggests that social capital uh, plays such a role in the case of visa refusal rates, perhaps less so in the case of passport power, so on and so forth. And we follow the first empirical strategy using the visa refusal rate, we see precisely that. So, uh, what is the dependent variable for the third strategy? Uh, in the third strategy is the level of hierarchy. You will see in a second there will be six blocks of countries from number one, which is Schengen, cream of the cream, up until number six, which will be Afghanistan and, 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 and like, right? So this is, that will be a variable that you want to explain. That will be odd probability regression that uh, explains this. All right, so impact of formal institutions of visa refusal rate, uh, as you will see in a second, uh, uh, institutions' roles and institutional services have the predicted signs. And these findings are robust to various controls and spe specifications. Here we go. Uh, the first regression, rule of law, government effectiveness, control of corruption, regulatory quality. Uh, rule of law and control of corruption are institutions' rules, and you will see that in all specifications, very robustly, very consistently, they have positive signs. And that means that improvement in the rule of law and corruption prevention makes uh, visa barriers all else equal higher than lower. Uh, and uh, we control, among other things, for uh, receiving countries. So receiving countries' dummies are involved, fixed effects are involved in this panel. Uh, as far as institution services are concerned, that this is government effectiveness of regulatory quality, same, very significant, very robust, negative correlation between those and barriers. If you improve institutional services in your home country, uh, you will make it easier for the citizens of this country to travel to other countries. So this is what we expected. 
Uh, let's turn now to social capital, and these are attempts to uh, use some, um, well, when you think about social capital, of course, Katya knows it probably better than others. The first thing that comes to your mind is trust. So let's see what role trust plays uh, in uh, visa regimes. Uh, uh, and it, it does play the expected role because there are two types of trust variable. Uh, this, well, blame Sasha for this awkward names. But uh, distrust binary being is basically uh, the answer to the question. Do you, that's the canonical question. Uh, do you believe that people can be trusted? And, uh, and uh, the, the more people answer no to this question, the higher will be visa barriers. So the lesser is the level of trust in your country, the higher will be the visa barriers. And the second one is, again, Sasha's uh, invention, trust ordered. And this is uh, an answer to the question, uh, would people around you take advantage of you if they can? And uh, the higher level of this variable means that uh, it's more likely or oh, it's less likely that people will take advantage of you. So you're surrounded by decent people. And again, it has the expected sign. And what about, uh, what about trust to different groups of people? Neighbors, families, or? No, uh, we, 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 did we do? No, we didn't. Do, we did. Creating broad trust and narrow trust. Right. I don't think we, do, we did that. But that's a good idea to but have a look. Even in cultural context. Sure. No doubt. Undoubtedly. Duly noted, Katya, many thanks. But let me take you to perhaps the main slide of this analysis, which confirms the complementarity between social capital and, <coughs> and, uh, and uh, uh, institutions' rules. Uh, uh, we include in our regressions interactions between the rule of law on the one hand and two uh, aggregates of social capital. One is called amorality, extent to which this country's people are immoral. Uh, extent to which they do not comply with uh, moral rules and requirements such as honesty, uh, concern for others, so on and so forth. Another one is uh, impropriety uh, or uh, the spread, the incidence of improper behavior in a given country. How common, how tolerant are people in a given country to behaving improperly? And these are, uh, as I said, uh, principal components, aggregations of some individual variables, and in the case of impropriety, one typical uh, variable of interest would be uh, answers to the question, uh, uh, do you, is it important to teach your children to obey or obey, to behave properly and to obey laws? And please have a look at these two red variables marked red in the fourth final column. These are interactions of the social capital measures and the rule of law, and these interactions all have highly high significance and the right sign. In other words, uh, uh, the higher, the more immoral or amoral a society is, the stronger will be uh, the negative, will be an increase in visa restrictions for this country's nationals if you strengthen the rule of law. And the same is true about the improper behavior. Uh, and well, this is a summary uh, and uh, but one thing to mention is that we can calculate uh, full marginal effects uh, in, this, uh, in this analysis, something that a reviewer in uh, our paper with Perisets, Ken Burris, on social capital taught us to calculate at some pain. And so if you calculate the full marginal effect uh, of, uh, of uh, visa rules, can it be negative overall? It can be, but it will be negative only for the most uh, amoral countries, for the countries with the lowest stocks of social capital. So if you have an immoral country with almost no social capital, uh, ideas of proper behavior and so on forth, and if you strengthen the rule of law in that country, then uh, these country's citizens indeed will be faced with higher visa barriers. Now let me turn, <coughs> real quick, I, I know I'm abusing your patience, uh, let me turn very quickly to the two remaining identification strategies. The, the second one deals with uh, visa restriction, aka passport power index. And here's a very simple regression, and basically it confirms uh, our hypothesis and the results that we observed by using a completely different data set, and that is with the refusal rate. Again, a uh, uh, rule of law uh, is negative for passport power. Now, uh, the coefficient should be different. If you have stronger rule of law, all else equal, there will be fewer countries that you'll be allowed to visit without a visa. Regulatory quality has a positive impact. There will be a larger number of countries that would allow you to go without. Government effectiveness, positive significant coefficient, 
Uh, and uh, so basically we confirm our findings by and large. And the third strategy, well, here is the, the name of this uh, Belgian grad student, Van der Maliere. There was a Soviet economist by name Katzen Ellen Bogen, and his colleague said that his last name would suffice for three Jews, not just one. So this Van der Maliere suffice for two Belgians, at least. Uh, so what, uh, what these two people did, and I, I don't know specifics of this analysis, let me make this, uh, this uh, disclosure upfront. Uh, and therefore, details uh, should be requested from Kuhn, who will be here often, as we know now. But basically, the idea is you can see the countries of the world as nodes of a network. And these regimes are arcs uh, of this network. If country A requires a visa from citizens of country B, then there will be an arrow, an arc, going from country A to country B. And then you run some stochastic analysis of this network. Uh, not Monet Carlo, it's not the painter, it's Markov Chain Monte Carlo. Uh, so Markov Chain Monte Carlo technique applied to this network uh, will produce several clusters of countries ordered in the terms of their uh, uh, freedom of international travel. And <coughs> uh, here are <coughs> these blocks of countries. You don't see what countries these are, but it gives you an idea of the of the uh, of uh, of the blocks, the smallest one is Schengen. So uh, international mobility increases when you go from bottom to the top and from left to the right. And here are these countries on the map. And here are what's this? Well, visa requirement red, no requirement green. This is all Greek to me, so I'll, I won't be coming, commenting on this. Give me a second. Oh no, my goodness. Okay. Uh, now, what is important is uh, this uh, ordered probability regression, which uh, regresses uh, the level of your country in this hierarchy on the very same variables such as regulatory quality and control of corruption, government effectiveness. And we see that the rule of law has, neg and rule of law, of course, right? So the rule of law still has a negative and significant coefficient. In other words, uh, the stronger is your rule of law, less equal the lower you'll be in this hierarchy. Whereas government effectiveness and regulatory quality have expected positive coefficients. I should also mention that control of corruption, in disagreement with the previous regression, this time has a positive sign, but it's not very strong or significant. So there are some uh, variations and differences in statistical conclusions, but the main findings of this paper, both theoretical and empirical, are that formal and informal institutions matter for visa bearers, although they do so in different and somewhat counterintuitive ways. Formal and informal institutions complement each other as factors of visa bearers. Improvement of institution services, such as government effectiveness, lowers the bearers. Improvement of institutions' roles could make these bearers higher and uh, social capital, uh, morality, and so forth is a mediator in this association. Thank you. Thank you very much. So now we have time for the questions. Any questions, comments? Yeah. Um, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I have a question about uh, one more factor for visa barriers that I have in mind. Can it be the case uh, that country's similarity plays a role. For example, uh, in, uh, it can be especially true for new uh, European Union members. For example, they differ in the levels of trust very much, the countries of uh, uh, Southern Europe and, for example, Scandinavian countries, uh, uh, they have a dramatic gap uh, in terms of trust. So, but uh, they have similar uh, very, mu very much so, Katia, yes, of course, although the example of the European Union is not a good one because they all membership Schengen, so no visa yeah. bearer spirit. But, uh, of course, uh, there are countries that have more affinity to each other for a variety of reasons, religious, language, uh, geography, common history, so on and so forth. And these are certainly factors which affect visa regimes. And uh, I'm not sure if you tried this controls uh, I'm afraid not, but they can be included. And uh, 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 we heard that question before. It's not to say that it's trivial; it's to say that it's very natural. And we try to reflect 
to it, but uh, I don't remember how persistently, but this is certainly something, it's some bilateral controls that you have to involve in your regressions to, uh, but on the other hand, what we do also in terms of Schengen, right, and remember we're talking at least in the first specification about refusal rate by Schengen countries, we control for individual Schengen countries. And these controls in our dyadic regression should, at least in theory, capture all of these details. So receiving countries' controls, at least to some extent, alleviate this problem. And there is another one that I should mention without waiting for some one of you to ask about that. And this is to about uh, ethnic minorities in receiving countries. Uh, and, and it's well, very well known that, for example, there are lots of Turks in uh, Germany, there are lots of Moroccans in here, and there are lots of Pakistanis there, and so on and so forth. So this also uh, affects uh, uh, visa regimes, and in a somewhat unpredictable way. I would expect that if there is a large minority, then it will probably make it more difficult for people from this country to travel as a ostensibly tourist to this country because of of the lower cost of staying there. Uh, but, uh, but again, uh, controls of receiving countries in Schengen should take care of that somewhat. Maybe a of institutions of the country, A minus the uh, If you include measures such as the one that you propose and another one that I mentioned, then you have to remove all the, region, all the receiving countries' controls, yeah. quite obviously, right, and see what role they will play. Mm -hmm. That's an alternative strategy, no doubts about that. What do I do to get a visa? <laughs> yep. uh, I just wonder, like, we have for quite a big number of Schengen countries. And those countries, even if they are neighbor countries, they might differ a lot in rules, in procedures, sure. and uh, like uh, acceptance rate for, for people from the given countries. Take, for example, Austria and Germany. Until recently, it was much more easier to get visa to Germany or to some other neighbor countries than to Austria, for example. Uh, but what are the explaining reasons for that? Because in, in the equilibrium environment, like we discuss, we discuss or it should be like all equal problems. I faced that myself, quite honestly. Uh, in 2004, there was a conference in Slovenia, and the conference was stuck in a, a north western corner of Slovenia and there were two countries essential in walking distance. Uh, one was, uh, one was uh, Austria, another one was Italy. And uh, my colleague, an American, and myself we rented bicycles and we decided to cycle to both of these countries in the same day. And uh, we arrived to national boundaries, national borders with Italy first and there was a border guard. At that time Slovenia was not yet a member of Schengen. And he barely looked at us. <laughs> he was, you know, <laughs> okay, you can go. And then when we tried to uh, to uh, to go to Austria after that, their border police and they were real Nazis. Uh, they were very tough. They inspected our passports. My Russian, his American. You know this and that and so on and so forth. And they gave us really a very hard time. They didn't quite believe us being. Uh, who we claim to be, perhaps because that was after some three hours of very tough cycling. Uh, uh, but uh, of course, different countries have different uh, uh, nuances of their visa policies, and oftentimes people behave strategically when they apply to Schengen countries. In other words, although Schengen has some some rules against that, uh, uh, if you want, and now I believe if you want to go to a Schengen country, you, first you have to get a visa to that country. And unless you can prove that your intent is to stay in that country, if, uh, if an immigration officer suspects that you want to go, say, to Italy, but for some reasons you prefer to get a visa to Spain, uh, it's a reason to refusing your entry, even if you have a Schengen visa. But, uh, but uh, implementation details of visa policies across Schengen, they vary, no doubts about that. And we see that in our data. By the way, Camila put together, I didn't have that, nice pictures on this presentation to show you, but they're really very interesting. We wanted to find some cases, some national cases, where uh, you have a given country and over a period of our observations, uh, institutions of this country change precipitously. And do you see an expected change in visa regimes? 
you have to be careful uh, with trying to find these examples because our conclusions are cross-sectional, not, not intertemporal. But nonetheless, and the country to ca that came first to our mind was Georgia. Uh, in Georgia, there was clearly a considerable improvement uh, in some kind of the rule of law, very peculiar rule of law, Saakashvili type rule of law, uh, where uh, the boss was still the key decision maker, but crime was suppressed and road police has become less corrupt and organized crime in particular was suppressed uh, in Georgia, big way. And uh, one uh, legislative novella by Mikhail Saakashvili was that uh, Godfathers uh, were of Zakonia for the very reason they are of Zakoni, even if uh, investigators have nothing against them at the moment, were subject to uh, incarceration. And uh, just because you are uh, a godfather, a criminal godfather. And that, of course, made all of these people, which were quite numerous, to flee Georgia. And many of them fled to Russia, <laughs> which was a kind of easy choice for them. So uh, that, I guess, is somewhat an illustration of the effect and mechanism that we had in mind. And when you look at the uh, at the nice pictures that we have now as to how that reflected in visa uh, refusal rates for Georgia, in some cases you see a very steep increase in visa refusal rates in Georgia, uh, which is kind of uh, uh, something that we expect. And uh, examples are uh, uh, Denmark, uh, Netherlands, uh, Central Western European countries, Sweden. But in some cases, you see a considerable decline of the refusal rates, which you cannot explain. In case of Italy, for example, the Italians were welcoming Georgians, perhaps because they had their own mafia, so they cared less. I don't know what the reason is. But certainly, there are variations in between Schengen countries. And this is uh, uh, the question that I would like to ask you, if you don't mind, is uh, how, if at all, that uh, makes our conclusions more questionable. And if so, what would be the suggestion that you have other than controlling for Schengen countries? I think uh, that still does not undermine our story. The fact that people strategically choose sometime, at least to, to an extent, their entry point to Schengen, that is true. And there are considerable variations. But, but since our results are not for, con for a particular country, but for, for the Schengen area at large, we see consistency. And, oh, by the way, another thing that I should mention is that we did similar analysis for refusal rates by the U.S. Not Schengen, but U.S., just one single country. In the case of U.S., we don't have these concerns. It's just one country, right? Same consular service, and we see pretty much the same results. Uh, here and there, they're a little bit less pronounced, but by and large, they're in agreement with our main story. And I should also mention that if you try to have another type of a panel, in other words, if you aggregate not over time, but over Schengen, and we have time as the second variable, again, results are the same, but again, with some somewhat less precision that we see in the case that I presented here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But if we, if we go back to their decision model of their consular officer, sure. and you say that uh, they have kind of priors according yep. to which they make decisions, so it might be interesting to look on the variables which might affect those priors, like for example the level of inequality in the country, because uh, if like people are more or less equal in the country, it means that you, like you can make typical decisions. But if inequality is different, good point. You just dispersion of education will be higher, or for example like a general level of education, it also could be a good basis for the priors, etc. <coughs> Very good point about inequality, in particular education as well. Uh, one thing to be concerned about is to avoid multicollinearity, because we use institutions and they're very strongly correlated with those variables. But one thing I would like to take home from this presentation that you suggested would be to have a look at uh, ethno-linguistic uh, fragmentation of the society, because that is not, well, again, it's probably negatively correlated with institutional quality, but that might be a thing to include and see if it matters, because in that case. And this uh, ethnic polarization, uh, it, it's known historically that some countries were forced to reintroduce visa requirements uh, against other countries simply because there were some minorities in these other countries that were, uh, you know, serial abusers of visa regimes. I know, for example, that uh, in the early 1990s, uh, the Czech Republic, soon after separation with uh, Slovakia, it received the visa-free access to Canada. And they enjoyed this visa-free regime for a couple of years. That was before the Czech Republic became a member of Schengen. But then Canadians slapped the visas back 
uh, simply because uh, Rom Romas or gypsies or whatnot living in the Czech Republic were traveling to Canada in drafts as ostensibly tourists and then stayed there. And uh, nothing else worked but visas. Yeah, well, uh, Gini, uh, I expect strong correlation between Gini and uh, economic institutions, so I'm concerned it might could result in some multicollinearity, but we should try uh, these variables, of course, and see what. Okay, yeah, sure, yeah, duly noted. I'm also interested in the comparative role of institutions and economic development GDP. Right. So the role of uh, you have GDP in your model? Not only I. This is, you know, there is, as I said, there is a literature quite big. Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean the comparative, so what is the comparative strength of GDP? Oh, example? good question. Excellent question, Katya. Thanks. I was going to mention that, but forgot to, and perhaps Sasha will be better able to do that. How much institutions add yeah. to our explanations over what was known before? How much more of reduction of R squared we observe? And uh, about 50%, right? Or, so we had another 50%. Uh, it's uh, like, mm -hmm. so it, uh, not 50 percentage points, but 50%. Mm -hmm. It's considerable improvement. It's mm -hmm. half of what was explained before. This is what explained, is explained by institutions. It's a lot. Although, but on the other hand, please note that changes sometimes are not very really dramatic, but to the extent you want to explain these changes, institutions do play a role. Thank you very much. Thanks very much.